So in this session, um, we want to look at the auditing process and then we see how each stage can be examined in the auditing process, uh, each stage of the auditing process can be examined. We we'll also discuss topical issues, which is what most of you guys have been doing. Um, I'm sure yesterday we had a topical uh, issues session. So we we'll also discuss topical issues critical thinking, how things can be examined, um, and all that. So amongst those topical issues, we'll be looking at ethics, the Companies Act, which Companies Act is going to be examined, is it the new one, is it the old one? Um, I'm sure that there's been communication to that effect, but we'll still re-emphasize it. What do you need to focus on? What are um, some of the revision areas that you need to go through with regards to the Companies Act? We'll also look at risk assessment, uh, technology and its impact on risk assessment. We also look at analytics because that's also a very topical issue. Uh, we also look at the audit of groups. Okay. So if you allow me now, we'll start with uh, the auditing process. We haven't 
sve da je Božić u počinu.
What do we use? King we use King 4 because King 4 also provides ethics for what? For corporate. Fair fact? Now examine that belief. So we're okay, I'll also get into a bit of detail as I go into the topical issues of these areas. Now let's go to the um, to the auditing process, pre-engagement activities. It can be examined as client acceptance, it can be examined as client continuance. Now we need to be clear. Are we accepting a new client or are we continuing with the client? Whether it's going to be procedures, whether it's going to be considerations, they will not be the same. I'll ask you a question. I'm sure most of us have dated, are married, uh, you know, at some point. General. Yes. Are you going to ask your your wife what where she comes from? <laughs> Are you going to ask her that? <laughs> yes, like now. Are you going to ask your wife where she comes from? Are you going to ask? Are you married? Are you going to ask your girlfriend what what her phone number is today after class? <laughs> You <laughs> would. So we then know where to place it. We know where to place it. We never know how we never get it. So we know where to place Guys, that's how that's how the examiner feels when you start writing. What industry are they in? Blah blah blah. What what rules and regulations govern this organization? If it's client continuance, these are things that you have already done at client what acceptance. You can't go and ask your girlfriend. So where do you stay? Huh? Every time you meet her, please give me your phone number. <laughs> <laughs> you want to marry me? So you need to know what are the changes. If your girlfriend changes her phone number, then it becomes important for you to ask her to ask for a phone number. If Fletcher say, for example, an organization then acquires a new subsidiary, then it becomes important to dig into that subsidiary, the rules, the regulations, etc. of that subsidiary. Fair and fine. Or otherwise, issues that you have faced last year. Because when you get into the next audit, you're saying, are these issues still outstanding? And remember, what is the ultimate objective for client acceptance or client continuance? It's a decision whether to accept or whether to continue. So whatever it is that you're going to put down, how fundamental is it? Is it something that's important enough to say, you know what, I would consider this or I would carry out this procedure? in determining whether to accept or to decline a client. Now if a client, um, let's say what, if a client obtained a bank loan, or has been, like obtained, yes, if a client obtained a bank loan, is that a risk assessment issue or is that a client acceptance issue? It's a risk assessment issue. So you need to be able to pick out to say, is this a risk assessment issue or is this a client acceptance issue? Now, I'm, I'm sure most of you, you guys, have, you, you have a tendency of separating real life from auditing. You cannot separate the two. I mean, if your firm or if your auditor was going to decline to audit you because you are funded by a loan, now who would be audit? I'm sure even some of us wouldn't have jobs there. Why would we be teaching you guys to go and do what? So you need to realize that some of these things do not mistake client acceptance issues with what? With risk assessment issues. Separate the two, they are not the same. There are also certain things, normally you find that with client acceptance or client continuance, they refer you to a particular area of the scenario. There is a reason for that. Now don't start considering things that they start talking about at reporting. 
there was an accident and then the, the management decided to, to, to hide that issue. Those, some of those things you would not know at client acceptance stage. So stick to the area of the required that they want, so to the area of the scenario that they told you to use. Because some of the things you would not know before entering into audit the client. That is why they restrict you to a particular area. Okay. What are some of the other things that are examined at pre-engagement? We need to know what standards, what auditing standards are being what? Examined. So we've got our ISA 210. We've got our ISA what else? Two. 220, why 220? Oh, I think the electricity is bad. Smart. Is that thing always on? Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately. Oh, okay, but the generator is not working. I hope, I hope that it, where have funds I hope the electricity comes back. You know, I don't like it. <laughs> So I was saying that why ISA 210? ISA 210 is linked to what? Guys, some of you guys, I told you. Because I bet they were more on that spot in Sunday to know what's so very well. But the recent Chimera family claim you have two years. She was in session. Why am I going to get started? ISA 220 is linked to what? Which standard? What is ISA two? Sorry, ISA 220, which standard? What does ISA 220 do? Guys, I'm offended. If I'm going to ask you IS 10, IS 16, if you respond, you guys will just be firing, firing, firing. Huh? <laughs> then I ask you what to standards, you guys go. I'll try. ISA 220. Quality control, right? ISQC1, quality control. Now, if the required comes and says, will such and such a firm be able to uh, conduct a quality audit? It means we're going to either ISA, we're going to go ISA 220 and ISA and ISQC1. ISA two, uh, 220 deals with the specific quality of a specific engagement. ISQC1 deals with quality control at firm level. Fair and fine? So they work hand in hand. As part of your pre-engagement, those are some of the things that you consider. Will we be able to conduct a quality audit? Will we be able to comply with the CPC? Fair and fine? Also, so we look at we look at three things. We look at ourselves as the auditor. And when we're looking at ourselves as the auditor, we're looking at ISQC1. ISA 220, which is a quality audit. We're also looking at will we be able to comply with the ethical requirements, which is our what? Which is our CPC. Will we be considered to be independent? Remember the auditor's report is called independent auditor's report, right? So we need to, to consider are we independent? The next thing that we look at after looking at ourselves is we look at the client. Is there someone that we want to work with? What are their operations? We come back to ourselves to have experience in auditing these guys, quality audit. Fair enough? What are, what are these guys standing? Are they people of integrity? What are they like? And so on and so on. How are they funded ETC that we'll also look at a little bit later again. When we've looked at the client, we're happy, we then go. We've looked at ourselves, we're happy, we've looked at the client, we're happy. The third thing that we look at is the terms of engagement. What are the terms of engagement? Is there a tight order deadline? Um, maybe that's when we're also looking at is there a tight order deadline? What are the audit fees like ETC? What are the things that we need to do for these guys? Are the things that we're doing for these guys complying with the CPC, the terms of our engagement? Are those things complying with the CPC? And what I want you to also take note of when you're dealing with the CPC is that you should know how the CPC is structured. When you are reading your scenario, 
the auditing exam is always uh, passed by those that pay attention to detail. If you do not pay attention to detail, you're in trouble. Fair fact, you're in trouble. It is in the first paragraph or the second paragraph or whatever, the introductory information, where you're told who you are. This is where you're told whether it's a recurring client or it's a new client. This is where you're probably told how long you've been auditing this client for. This is where you're told whether this client is listed or it's not listed. This is where you're told the industry in which this client is. And some of those things, things like, is this a new client or it's a recurring client? Things to do with the industry that the client is in. Those things will assist you when answering the rest of the scenario. It could be at audit evidence gathering stage. You need to know what industry are they in. It could be at risk assessment. You always need to be bearing in mind whether it's at opera financial statements level or it's at, at accession level. And we'll look at that when I get to that stage. Okay, so going back to the CPC now. This is where you're told how long you've been auditing this. So are you still independent? For how long should you be auditing before rotation? It's a listed entity, so a prerequisite is an engagement quality control review. It's a listed entity, so if you go to the CPC, the way that it is structured, it is divided, especially when it comes to the, the services that you can offer, it is divided into two, a PI and a non-PI. Have we seen that before? And a listed entity will fall into the category of a PI. What is a PI? A public interest entity. Now, for example, if in the scenario they're going to tell you that you've been asked to compile the financial statements and it's a listed entity, and then they go to require you to say, um, what are the ethical threats and provide safeguards, for example. If it's a listed entity, are you allowed to actually carry out those compilation services? No, you're not. No, you are not allowed to do that. So if you are not sure, quickly open your CPC, go to the area of the service that you've been what? You've been told of. Is it a listed? Therefore, it's a PI. Is it a non-PI? Are these services provided? Are these allowed to be provided? If they are not, so it's a threat to independence. So you write that. Even for a non-PI, compilation services are a threat to independence. Agreed? But the difference now is if the required is also asking you to provide what? Safeguards. Now if it's a pie, can you provide a safeguard of having Chinese walls or two different different uh, or two different things? <clears throat> no, you cannot because it is specifically what? Prohibited. So what would be your safeguard? <laughs> what would be your safeguard? <laughs> to decline what? The audit or the compilation? What have you been compiling for the past 10 years? So then the, your, your safeguard is going to say, consider declining one of the tweezers. But most likely, then you, if you're then going to take up the role as the auditor, you need to, to um, step down on your other services. So you need to know. This is why I'm saying pay attention to detail. Where is the exam? The auditing exam is in the start of the exam. All right? Three engagement activities. So that's that's almost what we what we need to do. A pre engagement. Be clear is a kind of acceptance is a continuity. Be clear, am I a new auditor or am I a recurring auditor? Now if you're a new auditor, it should mean something to you. What does it mean? If you're a new auditor, what does it mean? Opening balances means you need to think about that, right? You did not audit the opening balances. It means there is a predecessor auditor, most likely. Have you communicated with the predecessor auditor if it's required? But if you, if you are continuing, even if you run out of things to write, you do not speak about looking for going to communicate with the predecessor auditor, right? Because you are what? You are continuing. Is it a group that will most likely be talked about at the beginning of the what? Of the audit. 
and we'll look at what we need to concentrate on. Okay. We go to the planning stage. What happens at planning? Risk assessment. That's the major thing that happens at planning, isn't it? Risk what? Assessment. Now, risk assessment is very, very highly examined. In whatever form that you have seen, it can come. Fair and fine? So we need to know. But remember I said, as you're starting to, to read your scenario, they tell you that it is a bank. And some of us never think about that when we're doing our risk assessment. Can I ask you something? Whether it's risk assessment at overall financial statements level, or whether it's risk assessment at accession level, I'll throw this question to you. Um, you've got CAA, we all know CAA, right? What does it offer? It offers a service. Fair and fair? We've got a bank, what does it offer? A service. But these two companies, or these two things here, let's, let's use Stanbic. Stanbic and CAA are in two different what? Industries. Then we've got information on IFRS 50 on revenue. Would you agree with me that the risks that a bank faces when they are recognizing their revenue is different from the risks that an organization like CAA faces? So can you see that you need to think about the industry when you're doing risk assessment? Or else you're just going to memory dump just because you saw it on another revenue question, you're just going to come on, come with it and just write it down. Now CAA receives revenue in advance. But does a bank receive revenue in advance? So the risk that CAA is going to recognize as revenue, everything that they have earned, Confirm it exists, that risk exists with CAA, right? That today, if you're going to go to our accounts office, paying for someone who's doing CTA, there's a risk that the CAA accounts department is going to recognize everything that you pay today as revenue today. But is that the way that they're supposed to account for it? No, it's not. But who tells you that's not the way that they're supposed to account for it? If respected. So it means that at risk assessment, when you see a risk assessment question, one, you think about the interest. Two, you think about the standard. What if the standard is being what? Examined. That is what is going to tell you that this is a risk and this you can ignore. Fair in fact, you cannot do risk assessment unless if it's risk assessment over, let's say, the company's act. But most likely than not, you'll find that your risk assessment is going to come from an IFRS area, especially if it's at accession level. It's going to come at, it's going to come from an IFRS area. So you need to know which standard or which standards are being examined. It could be a group, it could be that they've disposed of a particular entity. And if they disposed of a particular entity, we're thinking about IFRS 10, we're thinking about IFRS 3, we're thinking about, you know, all that. So have you considered those? What does IFRS 3 say about um, a disposal or an acquisition? When do we start recognizing that as part of our group? Is that a possible risk that we will not comply with those rules? Do we have control? IFRS 10 tells us what control is, is it? So should we be consolidated? So you cannot separate that from the standard. Risk assessment, especially at, um, at, at a session here. And then even at overall financial statements level, you need then, if you're going to do risk assessment, especially at overall financial statements level, you have to first understand the entity, even at a session level. Now some of us go into an exam, we read a scenario and we don't even understand. Now, if that happens, do not want you read again. No one here is busy trying to earn 100%. If you are, then probably you're in the wrong place. No one here is even busy trying to earn 80%. If you are, then you're in the wrong place. 70, no one here is thinking about doing 70. Everyone here is just thinking about just crawling. Lift up your hand, call the invigilator to you. 
ask them, I think I know, I need to go to the restroom. Go to the restroom, wash your face, dilly-dally in the restroom, think about things that excite you, go back to the restroom, sit down, reboot yourself, and start eating. <laughs> Say in all material respects, 
such and such complies with rules. So it means that if, and the company said, if you go to audit, if you're going, remember I said substantive procedures. I don't know, I haven't seen an ITC paper without them, like all four papers somewhere, substantive procedures will come. I have not yet come across them. If it does happen, you guys will be the first. I don't know what those chances are. Now, audit evidence, it means that, again, when you see a substantive procedures question, you're asking yourself which audit standard am I using. If it's audit, um, audit evidence over groups, it means that you need to know that your ISA 600 kicks in. If it's over accounting estimates, you know that your ISA what, 540 what, kicks in, right? However, and your ISA 500 definitely kicks in. You also need to know what IFRS, which IFRS is being examined here, or how many, which IFRS are being what? Examined. If you don't know that, if you don't know which IFRS are being examined, uh, <laughs> I haven't been taught how to do counseling yet. I've been bothering to say, please take me for counseling session. Lessons, not sessions. I need to learn how to cancel people. I, I, I think. But you need to know which influences are being examined so that you know what is important. How do I obtain what it wants? If something is important, what, what is evidence would you want to obtain? If something is important, whether it's it's a, it's an important machine, <laughs> it's an important machine, and you need to obtain audit evidence over an important machine. Which which standards are we dealing with? If we standards, IS sixteen, right? What does IS sixteen tell us? The cost, doesn't it? What should be capitalized into the cost? Are those not some of the substantive procedures that you want to carry out? Right? Which are the standard IS21? What does IS21 tell us? You know, you guys want to give me God's What is the only one that can listen to a million people at the same time? I cannot. Yes. So IS21 will tell us exchange rates. Sir. We have never seen a set of financial statements with three different currencies. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I tell you true. So IS21 will tell us which date to use. Sir. So if you're going to formulate a procedure over there, how will you know if you do not know that IS21 is the one that determines this? If you do not know that if IS16 is the one that determines when the risks and rewards pass, when do we start owning this? So that you can link with that and say, so what is the date and which exchange rate should be what? Should be used. If you do not know your IFRS and it's a substantive procedures question or your company's act where to go to, then highly unlikely are you going to generate enough what? Enough points. So you need to know those things. Alright? Other than the auditing standards, the, um, the accounting standards, you also need to know your general procedures. Alright? Now please don't back on them. Last time, some people wanted to kill me, but it happened. Um, they can tell you that they were already to be done. <laughs> they can tell you that this have already been what? Done. So don't don't entirely back on them. But let's maximize on the general procedures. If you maximize on them, you find that you can come up with about five general procedures. And most likely, more likely than not, your general uh, your substantive procedures question can be about let's say 60. And remember, no one is looking for 100 percent, no one is looking for 80, 70, 80, 70. we're all looking for at least 50. So what is 50 of 16, that's 8. 
If you can come up with five general procedures, then you're almost on your way to passing. If you can just think about a few differences, come up with, uh, with three more procedures, one from, two from IS-21, from uh, IFRIS, sorry, IS-16, one from IS-21, you're done, you've passed. <laughs> That's how easy passing is. I mean, it's, it's for you to fail. That's how easy passing is. Okay, but you guys, the, the reason why you don't pass or you will face challenges in passing is because you want to get 100%. So you, you pressure yourselves too much. You don't need to get 100%. Who cares? We lifted up their hand when I came in and said, Tonya, can you tell us your marks from CTA to ITC to APC to what? We've dealt with that. Another thing is, if it's, if, if as much as possible, think about the analytical procedures that you can carry out. This figure that you've been given, can you compare it to last year and follow up on any what? Discrepancies. Also, the other thing is, can you also, is it a, you need to know once by starting point, does this thing that I have to audit, does it have opening balances? If it does, the opening balances are your what? Your starting point. All right? So we'd actually want to go and agree the opening balances, prior opening balances to, um, to what we have, right? That's a procedure that you can carry out. What, um, what, what do you call them? Um, analytical procedures, they come from your ratios, right? What ratios can be used to calculate, or what, this figure, let's say it's revenue. Revenue, yes, doesn't have opening balances, fair and fine, but revenue can be used to calculate particular, what, ratios. And those your analytical procedures. So can we name one or two and say let's calculate these ratios, confirm if they are consistent with uh, with let's say prior years, follow up with management for any discrepancies. Is that a, a reasonable procedure to do? So think about your analytical procedures. <coughs> if you cannot come up with analytical procedures, don't force it. It's okay. We'll do other procedures, they'll come out, right? Don't force it. Don't overwrite as well. Some students have a tendency of overwriting. You don't need to overwrite, you just need to know what you need to do to maximize. I'll tell you this, guys ITC is easier than CTA. Because even um, at CTA, people are very strict, the universities everywhere. People are very strict, they're actually very strict on you guys. But when they get to ITC, it's not as strict. If only you knew what happens, you'd ask yourself, will I honestly fail? I'm not saying people make people pass, no, I didn't say that. But what I'm saying is, it can be done, it can easily be done, if you just focus, it can easily be done. Um, all right. So your general procedures, what are some of those? Obtain a signed and dated management, what? <coughs> Representation date. I spoke about you being able to get about five months, but the thing with general procedures is they are easy. So because they are easy to get, they are very strict. You need to pay attention to detail. Now, if, if you don't put signed and dated, they can just decide not to give you the mark. That's how important it is. If you then don't, um, maybe let's say you cast and you cross cast, those are some of the things that you need to do. Uh, obtain a schedule of this, so the calculation of this, cast and cross cast to confirm what? Mathematical accuracy. Those are some of your general procedures. Um, you, you go from the schedule, whatever it is that you're working from, you agree that to the GL, to the trial balance, to the AFS. You don't agree to the AFS, to the TB, to uh, -uh. You will not get your marks. We agree from outside the system something that we've worked on into the system. So we come from, would have done this, and this is why we say cast and cross cast this. Do this, do that. That's possibly, it could be your GL. It could be sitting, that's the figure that's sitting in your GL. So let's agree to that. What's in the GL? From the GL, we go to the TB. From the TB, we go to the AFS. Let's agree in that what? Sequence. If you agree in your favorable sequence, it's okay, but uh, you, 
you know what to that I said, I don't need to spend now. Evaluation and concluding. So controls, okay, maybe before I go to evaluation and concluding. Controls, what happens with our what? With our controls. So you find that, as I said, you can be asked to test controls. You can be asked to formulate, they can give you a systems description. And most likely than not, they are not going to, they are going to give you a computerized system. Right? They are unlikely, highly unlikely going to give you a manual system. Now your manual controls, they can tell you something is done online and then you want people to be printing and ticking. That doesn't make sense. So your controls will need to be what? Computerized controls that suit that particular system. Let's use the documents that have, that have been discussed or that have been talked about in the system. If they don't call it a receipt, don't call it a receipt. Okay. If it's a signature that, need, that needs to be there and it's an electronic system, so what type of a signature do we expect to find? An electronic what? Signature. Don't expect people to download, sign, and blah, and blah, and blah. Make sure that if it's a computerized system, you stay to what? To, that, to, to the computerized controls. All right. Then when we come to evaluation and concluding, evaluating and concluding as well as reporting. Okay? So you find that your audit reporting um, has not been highly, highly examined. I don't know why, so it can start with you. There's a year that, they never used to examine groups a lot. Then there's a year that we came to the students and we said, you know what, groups are not normally examined, so yeah, you can just go through them, and then that year they examined groups. So your evaluation and your concluding, just bear in mind that it has not been examined, examined in a long time. So it might as well, what? But we've also got things at evaluation and concluding, things like going concern. That is what has normally been coming. So you need to know your going concern, whether it's substantive procedures over the going concern, whether it's assessing whether an entity is a going concern or it's not, whether they could actually be asking you to say, what documents do you expect to find? You can also expect that. It can also be a question that's to do with audit evidence. And they ask you what documents do you expect to, to find. Now what are we dealing with? Which part, because some of you might just go blank. Which part of a substantive procedure are we dealing with when they say which documents do you expect to find? Or can you ask? We've got a how, a, the how, the what, and the why, is it? So which part of the substantive procedure are you just looking at? The what is it? When you are stuck, just think what substantive procedures will I come up with? The what, the what, the what, that's the document, that's the document. Put it down. Okay. Alright. So you should know your going concern. Some of the topical issues that are going to be examined are things that are happening in South Africa. Like I said, we all know where this exam is coming where it originates. It's an ICAS exam, it's localized for Zimbabwe, but we know it originates in South Africa. So we know that things like going concert, that can be examined. Things to do with technology, we'll look at it a little bit better. Um, when we do this. So we need to know, um, as I said, these are some of the highly examinable areas. Then we can, let's go now to the companies and as I said, we know which section of the companies, so which companies act are going to be examined on, which is um, the, the old or the outgoing companies act. Oh, okay, maybe before I go to that, I need to just deal with a few housekeeping issues in terms of the exam. When you go to the exam, I'm sure you were told that they will tell you that answer this part of the question in this particular booklet. Right? Please answer in that particular booklet. If you don't answer in that particular booklet, you're going to be in trouble. This is not, some of us, I'm sure those that did their CTA at bigger universities, you know, you know, you understand what that means. But if you did your CTA at a smaller institution like CAA, uh, you're in trouble if you do that. Because CAA would simply say, ah, you know, we can't let the student fail. Let's just take whatever, wherever they did, let's take it to the correct department. And the correct department is just the next day. <laughs> So, 
So really, it wouldn't be a big issue, is it? Yeah. But then now, if you don't answer in the book, in the blue booklet, what happens with marking is um, they mark the paper, fair and fine. Um, and, and they mark at different times, in different locations. That's how they mark. So if you do not um, answer in the appropriate booklet, you might be asking, it could be uh, belonging to a team or a chief, it could be, uh, it's, it might be supposed to be marked by a team that is not yet there, or that is already marked and is already gone. So no one will mark for you. And they, they, unfortunately, they don't. You can just, they'll just say, the all is coming. So please make sure that you're strict on yourself, answer in the appropriate what? Booklet. It doesn't matter. Now, when I did my CTA, I remember asking myself, so we were told that, you, you know it's a different subject because you're answering in a different booklet, right? You know it's, they tell you blue, they tell you pink, it's a different subject. Now, when I did my CTA, when I wrote my CTA exam, to be honest with you, sometimes I was shocked that it's a different subject. Like, oh, oh, blue. I thought this was what to do. But yeah, you have to do what they say. Just answer. They'll tell you which part of the required is supposed to be answered in a particular way. So please make sure we speak to them. They could be asking for memos, they could be asking for emails, they could be asking for something. Let us give them what they want. If it's a memo, what does a memo look like? It's a written memo at the top or memorandum. It's written to from date subject. We have never seen a memo that's called memo for write what they have asked you. Remember, I said you guys are just looking for 50%. Five marks of the 50 are coming from presentation marks. So, yippee, easy. What are we looking for? We're looking, we're working for, um, for 45 to pass. Oh, So if they ask for a memo, give them a what? Give them a memo. And no one wants to know what your true name is. You are given a title at the beginning of the exam. Remember I said that's why the first paragraphs are very important, right? You are given a title at the beginning of the exam. Use that title. Others ask me what about the student number. Remember the student number is outside the scope of the exam. So I wouldn't recommend that you use the what? You use the... <coughs> The student number. What happens if you write your name? They won't mark. They will think that you are trying to influence a mark. So you can be called for a year. They will not mark if you write your name. So, yeah. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry.
What are you mainly looking for in the Companies Act? You're looking for things that affect accounting, those sections that affect accounting. You're looking for those sections that affect auditing. And you're looking for those sections that affect governance. So governance, anything to do with the directors, that is governance. That falls part of governance. So you're looking for those sections. Just in case you might be wondering, which sections am I going to look at? We are not doing law, so we don't necessarily have to know the whole Companies Act. That's the good thing. But mainly focus on those what? On those areas. And the, there's a section that I'm going to just highlight to you guys. What happens is, as I say, because this is set, I need to highlight these things to you guys. And, and because they're very important. These things are set, in, they, or they originate from South Africa. And so obviously though they originated from the, company, the South African Companies Act. Now, unfortunately, the Companies Act that you guys are using does not have most of the sections that the South African Companies Act what? has. But the new one, ah, if you write that one, good. You don't need to worry, is it? But the thing is, so it means that there's a section called Section 318. Go and look at that one. Most likely than not, when you're stuck, it's relevant. Is it? So that one is mainly to do with, uh, with governance, mainly to do with the directors, that they, they should actually run the organization um, in a proper manner, ETC, ETC. So any non-compliance with laws, ETC. And you're wondering, so how is this non-compliance with the Companies Act, Section 3 of it, right? Any, um, anything to do, like any negligence or something like that, Section 3 of it. Right? So if you find any concerns, if you've got any worries, go to section what? Most likely section 318 is going to kick in. But what am I saying? I am saying do not go into the exam without having looked at section 318. Okay. At least you then use it when it's not relevant. Okay. So you find that ethics are also highly examinable because of the issues that have been emanating in South Africa the challenges that have been happening with the auditors. Now, I will not want to mention a lot of those issues. This time, mention your firm, is it? It's not you, it's the firm. So, <laughs> I tell you, it shouldn't matter. But uh, because of those issues, ethics of the auditor are, are highly examinable areas, which is your CPC. So let's know it. Let's know how to maximize on our marks when, it, when the CPC is being examined, but it will cover this in the last section. Fair enough? If you are not here in the last section, go and look for an ITC paper with a CPC question. This is why I was saying CTA is more difficult than what? Than ITC. Because the number of marks that you can get on just one issue, where you used to get one mark at CTA, you can get maybe even up to three at CPC. I want you to bear this in mind. Why? Because it has an effect of possibly frustrating you if you don't bear it in mind. If you don't know how to split and get your marks. Why? What's going to happen? They're going to examine the CPC, give it 18 marks. And you are used to the way that maybe CTA used to examine, where they used to give you just one mark. And then you're wondering, why am I not generating enough? But maybe you have already generated what? Enough. Or maybe you're leaving out something that's very important for you to get half a mark or that one mark. Alright, so let us make sure that we know how the ITC um, solutions are structured in all our courses. Because if you don't do that, it is going to frustrate you. I said there's not enough detail. 50, 50 doesn't matter. Remember, ITC says what? 200 marks, the three courses above 50, and one with a sub minimum of 40. So, so. <laughs> okay, let me tell you this. All right, let me tell you this. For you to pass ITC, you need a minimum of 200 marks across all four courses. That's one, right? So, what it means is that. Um, ideally it's 50, 50, 50, 50. But then they then say that three of the courses should be at least 50 and what? And above. With one course, they'll allow you one course to get not less than 40. 
So if you've got a strength in a particular subject, you maximize that one. Right? And I'll put the You know, pass it. And I'll put Yes.
did they meet the special resolution? If first, if the particular decision is supposed to be made at the AGM, was that decision made at the AGM? If a notice is supposed to be sent out before, let us say it's even an uh, appointment of auditors. If a notice is supposed to be sent out um, before that meeting, was that notice sent out? Those are like your review areas, your concerns, or, or reviewing for compliance. Okay. Then we've got our risks, our business risks and our, our auditing risks. We need to know the difference before we get into the exam. What is the difference between your auditing risk and, 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 your, and your business risk? Because most of the times you see you guys asking for risk set over financial statements level and you guys are busy writing business risks, business risks. Yes, they are correct, they are risks, but they are not auditing risks, so they will not end you much. If it's a risk question, we need to look out for. What are they asking for? Is it risk assessment or is it discussing risk? If it's a risk assessment question, what's the difference between discussion of risk?
Now, most of us, yes, we can write correct things, but if it is not what has been required, it is not going to earn you much. So what does this mean? Remember, I said we pay attention to detail. Remember that? So it means that when we get our required, we underline keywords, audit risk, risk of material statement, at a session level, or at overall financial statements level. We underline those things. Because those are the things that are going to earn us the marks. If we write anything outside that scope, it is not going to earn us marks. If it's at audit evidence, if they asked you for a particular assertion, for a particular section, if it's controls, if they ask you for particular objectives, validity and accuracy only, what does that then mean? We need to know the meaning of our assertions. Fair We need to know the meaning of our assertions. If they're saying completeness, what is completeness? And where can we find that? In our ISIS. I'm not going to tell you which one because you should know. In our ISIS, what is the meaning of accuracy? So that if they ask you to formulate substantive procedures over existence, you do not formulate procedures over completeness. You just formulate over what? Existence. You also need to know what are my control objectives in terms of your validity, your accuracy, and your completeness. What is the meaning of a valid transaction? What is the meaning of accuracy in, in light of test of controls? What is the meaning of completeness? So what type of controls do I need to have to make sure that the system captures everything completely? Because they can just ask for completeness. Controls over completeness. Let's stick to that. As much as it is correct, if you give controls over accuracy, they're not going to earn any marks. So paying attention to detail. Understand your required. What, number one reason of students failing, lack of understanding of the scenario. Number two reason of students failing, lack of understanding of the required. You think that the required, the scenario that you read yesterday, remember auditing has just a few requirements. They're all the same. But the scenario is the one that's different. So if you pay attention to the scenario, come back again, pay attention to your required. What exactly are they asking me to do? It's a general control, so therefore give them general controls. If it's application controls, give them application controls. Okay, please let's make sure that we pay attention to those things. And remember I talked about, um, about the IT, you need to also just have an idea how does the IT environment affect controls, the control environment. You can Google some of these things up. Why? Because at least if you just have a general knowledge of how the IT environment affects the control environment or whether it's a computer, when a computer is processing financial data or anything like that, what are some of the auditing risks that you can, you can see? Just the same way, when it comes to business risks, you can also Google some of your business risks. Because at least when you're now reading the scenario, it will be easier for you if you just know the, the, um, the brackets or the, the quadrants of your business risks. Okay, so it's also good that you can, you can know those things, all right? So with regards to your IT also, you don't need to worry too much because as it says, it's not an IT course, so it's not like you need to know all your, your you need to know a detailed computer environment. They'll give you the description. When you're reading, ask yourself, what can possibly go wrong in this sentence? So what control can I put to plan it? What can possibly go wrong? What control can I put to plan it? What can go wrong as you're reading your what? With the description of your system. And you'll be able to come out with it. Okay. So risk assessment, as I said, is very important. Um, it's a fundamental part of the auditing. Why? Because the ISA audit is a risk-based audit. So you need to know risk assessment. All right. Okay. So some of these things I talked about them. Um, okay. Technology. I'll first tell you a story so that my story emphasizes that. 
So the other time there was there was uh, a lot of noise at Saika, and um, the noise was coming from technology. Why? Because the scenarios that Saika has been producing, most of them, as you know, they're, they're surrounding technology. It could be about an, an airplane. It could be about a hotel and a hotel system. Um, you know, at the airport, something like that, and, and IT systems. So there was a fight, and the fight was, you know what? Uh, you guys, you are making people fail. Why? Because, you know, in South Africa, the whole race thing is a big issue. In Zim, it's not. I'm sure, yeah, there are just too many of us doing this thing that, why are you going to cry out for this? this is not. So in South Africa, it's a big issue. So the people there were saying that, but you know what, you're disadvantaging the what? The, the African student over the Boa student or the English student. And the reasoning behind that was, they were saying that if you're going to bring a computerized environment, this person has maybe never even seen a computer. Or maybe they just started dealing with computers way, like way later in their lives. You're going to bring a scenario about a hotel system, a computerized hotel system. This person has never been in a traditional hotel. What about if you talk about Airbnb? This person has never been on a plane. Now you talk about trying to book a booking system, an airline booking system, when this person has never been to the airport. You know? So these were some of the arguments that were coming across. And the, the conclusion was, but we are producing a CA. And when the CA has qualified, uh, should the CA be hired based on their race? Definitely not, isn't it? So what type of a CA are we producing? A CA for, you know, what used to happen years, ages ago before computers. We used to go into the bank, write on your, in your bank book, they stamp, blah, blah, blah. They cannot produce a CA like that. They have to produce a CA that is forward looking, that's getting into the future. So you should know that technology, at least, most likely, at least one of your scenarios is maybe going to be um, about one of these new industries, like maybe your Ubers, um, you know, your Airbnbs, some of those things, right? That's, that's maybe where your disruptive technologies. It could be about um, controls over a cloud system. They could ask you for controls over that. So expect some of those things. So what am I saying? Have an understanding of those disruptive what? Technologies. And we know that we're in the fourth industrial revolution. I'm sure those of us that follow the political arena, some people are making ways about that. Right? We're in the fourth industrial revolution. So therefore, whatever we do needs to be tailor-made to what? To suit that. So it could be, it could be a, a, a mobile banking system and they're asking for controls or substantive procedures. It could be an online booking system in hospitality. It could be risk assessment over those what? Those industries. Um, your Ubers, your buyers, your Airbnb. What is Airbnb? Uh, yes. So it's a it's an app. It's an app? Yes, so it's online, right? So you can actually book for a hotel room or residence, maybe it's a, somebody, an apartment, just temporary, not permanent, using Airbnb. So they could give you Airbnb as a business, describe how Airbnb makes their money, and then they can say what are the risks and over financial statements here. Now if you've, if you've never seen that business model before, now when you know what we mean by a business model, is it? How these guys are really making their money, etc, etc. If you've never seen that, and the first day that you're seeing that is in the exam, now it's going to throw you off. Because for you, you, you won't even understand the scenario, because you've never seen, you've, you've never heard of anything like that. So what am I saying? When you're relaxing, when you're relaxing, and you know you've just got a few minutes on your hands, just go through some of these disruptive technologies, just go through some of these business models, new business models, just go through them. Just understand them, because they might be examined, okay? Your social media, LinkedIn recruitment, uh, streaming apps, ETC, you could be given that as a business. 
And so you need to come up with what? With controls or something like that. Tracking apps for, ba for buses, for trains, for aircrafts, whatever. Tracking, uh, tracking apps. That could be a business or that could be whatever it is. They could just what? Examine on those things, on those technologies. So it's very important, as I talked about the cloud, virtual. If they say virtual, do we know the terms? If they say a cloud system, what is a cloud system? Now, no one will describe terms for you. If they say live streaming, I'm sure we all know it. But I'm just saying, do we really know those things? So that we don't panic when we get into the exam. A cloud system, and then they, they can ask for that. A virtual, virtual class or something like that. And then they can also examine that. Do we know what a virtual something is? Okay. We also need to know that because of, of this, what has happened, just to understand these disruptive what technologies. So it could be that software is being offered as a service. We, we can see that, isn't it? That's what's happening these days. Software is being offered as a service. Infrastructure is being offered as a service. We all know that there's a business model, for example, whereby this, this whole classroom can just, we know we can have uh, office desks, etc. And somebody just comes and rents for a particular what? Hour or something. It's a boardroom, we've all heard about that, whereby you just go, you rent a boardroom for a particular what? Meeting. So that's infrastructure as a service. But if you've never heard or if you've never looked, gone out there to read more, to look out for those things, what are the risks of that? What are the risks associated with that? If you at least just go. Now, I'm not saying this is what is going to come, but I'm saying you are better off at least having an idea, just in case it what? It comes. Okay. A platform as a service, and somebody can make money just from that platform. Okay. And we also need to realize that the business model that is being used by many organizations these days is to try by all means to cut down on that which is fixed. And live more on a what? On a, on a variable costing system. I'm sure if, if it was years ago, an organization like CAA would be owning a big printer, etc., etc., right? And then after that, uh, you realize that ah, printing has become too expensive. You've employed three people in printing. Now you don't know what to do with them. And students are not coming anymore, so it's costly to even run this printer. So, you know, people do not want to have a fixed what? Uh, a fixed business. And so obviously people are offering those as their business. So we need to understand that. And you need to come up with your risks. And your risks, if you ask for risks, give risks. If they don't ask for recommendations, don't give. It could be King 4, it could be CPC. If they do not ask for safeguards, don't give them safeguards. They don't want them. <laughs> give them what they want. That is what is going to earn you the ones. Analytics has become very important. You could have an exam whereby they're describing a system, and then they, they ask you to um, go the yeah, they can describe a system, and then they ask you for the analytical procedures or the reports that you can expect to find to confirm that your revenue is complete. Don't worry, it's not out of this world. I don't want it. it can be done. Yeah, to be honest, I personally think that you guys are learning hard things. You know? I'll, I'll be honest. I, I personally don't think I learned things this hard. But um, it's okay. It's like that. Yes. So in our last uh, session, when we were revising our book, I think there was a question about concerns that we had... Uh, <clears throat> yeah. On, yeah. And she emphasized on the fact that even if safeguards are not being asked, you have to just tell them. Because those are some of the things that will add. You remember where okay. in city you used to have one mark because they were asking for consents and they needed consents. But then if you break down safeguards and recommendations, then you actually generate like four marks 
All right. You know. So, so that is now dependent on a particular part and on the style of what of ITC for a particular section. Otherwise, give them what they have asked for. So, as we're practicing, right, we go and we look at what is this, what is the solution structured like, and we stick to that. Otherwise, we give them exactly what they have asked for. Is that good enough? So in terms of our analytics, um, there's an example that I normally give. You can be told that it's a hotel, and then they tell you that um, they give you a set of financial statements, or whatever business, they give you a set of financial statements. Two, three years, right? Then they tell you things that actually happened in a particular what? Yeah. And then they can tell you that this was assessed as low, this was assessed as high, this was assessed as what, as what, as what. Fair fine? Now you need to go back to your information and say that they have told me that revenue last year was 15,000. This year revenue was what? 15,200. But then somewhere in the scenario it's a hotel. I didn't hear about fees, so the hotel, um, the money that you pay, the what you call it, I don't know, that is. They tell you that they never went up, right? They tell you that in that particular year, major repairs and maintenance was going on. So at some point in time, certain hotel rooms or what, were closed off. And then they tell you revenue actually went up. Do you think that revenue is correct? No, it's not. But if you do not, now they're not going to tell you these things in secrets. And they're not going to link them for you. But what you need to do is to read the scenario. Go to your set of financial statements. If they've asked for particular line items, concentrate on those. If they've asked for everything, concentrate on everything. They tell you that you look at your set of financial statements. Repairs and maintenance shot up. But then maybe they're saying the majority of that is coming from repairs and maintenance of the hotel rooms. And then you're saying these guys had major repairs. So major repairs means that certain things need to be capitalized. So don't you think that's probably a high risk area? And you need to further what? Look at that. That's your analytics. Analytics goes hand in hand with critical thinking. And, and it's difficult to teach critical thinking. But what I can say is critical thinking is connecting unseen dots. To say that because there were repairs, because these guys are saying this, so therefore this does not make sense. It's an unseen dot, right? There are unseen dots that you're connecting and saying, if I connect this and that and that, therefore this answer cannot be sensible. Fair and fine, that is critical thinking. And that is going to be required of you a lot. Why? Because, as you know, I'm sure you've heard of the CA 2025 project. <laughs> CA 2025? Okay. So there is what is called the CA 2025 project. You know, um, CAs are not going to wait and be extinct. Definitely will not do that. So they, what's happening is uh, the profession is actually moving towards a different direction. And make sure you pass before this comes. Um, very soon, CA 2025, meaning to say that is the CA that should be produced in the year 2025. Meaning to say that it is going to be a fact. So you need to pass before you get there. You know, I'm not trying to scare you but I'm just giving you answers. You need to just pass, because if you don't pass by then, things can actually change, and you might actually have to relearn everything. So you'd rather pass. So what's happening is, we're in a transition between CA 2025 and the old. That's why I keep saying, you guys are learning more difficult things than us, right? If, if you assess a, a 2000 and something paper, an early 2000 and something paper, and you assess it with a, and you compare it to a paper that was written, let's say January last year, you will confirm what I'm saying. You will actually confirm it. It, it is now different. 
right? So I also recommend that as you're practicing, at least do more of the more recent papers before going to the very old papers, before going to 2000. You need to have done 2018. Okay. So because um, of this, this project that's happening, the CAs are not just going to be calculating, calculating, calculating. This is where also I say you guys are learning more difficult things. Because in the past, someone would be just told to produce a journal entry, right? Produce journal entries. Someone would be just told to calculate variances. Someone would be just told to calculate something. And most of the marks would come from the calculations. But if you look at what the exams that you guys are writing now, most of the marks are not coming from your calculations. They're coming from the analysis that you make after the calculations. Can you make sense of the calculation? Because there's technology. Technology is going to be what? Um, doing these calculations. So therefore, that's where the auditor comes. That's why you need to understand, you need to be able to come up with controls more by a technological what? Uh, environment or system. That's why I'm also emphasizing that because that's the direction that the profession is taking. So you'll find that analytics are going to be very important. Critical thinking is going to be very important and this is why they, they've started examining like this. Because they cannot just wake up and say, we've changed the curriculum. We've revamped all of a sudden. It has to be done gradually and you guys are part of the, that gradual. At least I wasn't, but you guys are. So, we need to know what are analytical procedures and what happens. So, at the end of the day, you can be given low data, but you need to make sense of it through anal analyzing that data, through interpreting it, so that it makes sense to, to the next person. Okay. So, artificial intelligence, we know what that is. So you could be told of a system that actually what extracts information, or you could be, this is where, you know your artificial intelligence, you guys are auditors. And then they say to you, um, what type of reports do you expect to find? Before something can be called obsolete, for example, it could be they give you a retail company, um, a retail uh, business, let's say in the clothing industry. And then they tell you that um, we would like to, um, maybe to look at our, what, what, what is it that informs our um, provision for obsolescence. Then they tell you they've got a system. And then they say in this system it operates like this, like this, like this. What reports should be extracted for you to then determine whether to what? To, to determine whether something should be provided for obsolescence or not. This can be examined. So what is it that you need to do? <coughs> as much as these things sound all fancy, all difficult, you need to go back to basics. What is provision for obsolescence? It is an estimate. So if I'm going to be estimating something, what type of reports do I want? So whenever you see something that you do not understand, something that you've not seen before, and this can happen, in, in, your, in all your four papers, it's bound to happen that you meet a required that you have never seen. A required that you just know it's going to be answered in the blue booklet, but you are never taught in FINAC, auditing, math, or taxation. That can happen. What do you do? You go back to basics. Try and deduce. What exactly is being examined here? Okay. Just go back to your basics. Do not panic. Do not even what? Panic. In one year, um, most of us have been to, to work, so it would be okay. But if, you, if we haven't, so in one year, for example, they examined on a contract. They described the business. And then now, um, one of the key people a key man didn't have a contract. A key man wasn't what? Formally employed by that organization. And then they said, what are the considerations that the key man would make before accepting the contract? And what are the considerations that the organization should make in offering in the contract? So what are those considerations? Now, if, if I ask you, is that taught in any course? No, it's not. But that's where 
your instinct comes in. That's where your critical thinking ability what comes in. In that also, in that one year again, they also gave a, a business, and that particular business was operating in one country, producing a particular product in one country, and they, they wanted to <coughs> venture outside that particular country and to go into another country. And so they were thinking, how best do we do that? Do we go and partner somebody who's already producing that same product in that other country? Or are we going to get into that country through um, those networks that are just going to sell for us? So what is it? Basics that students missed was, do we make, do we make in this particular country? Do we produce in this particular country? Do we import, sorry, do we export into this country? Or do we produce into, in that country? That was the basics. So whatever it is that you're going to consider in coming up with that decision, if you had not gone back to basics to say, but wait a minute, this whole arrangement, what is it really all about? It's one about diversification. So either way, whether we produce in that country with diversified, right? Whether we then uh, team up with somebody who's already in that, um, it's a, a, a marketing network in that country, we've already what? Diversified. Fair enough? But the means of diversification is different. So you're supposed to step back, wait a minute, what's going on? What are the basics? And then you'll be able to come up with a solution. Expect some of these things. But don't panic, no matter what happens. And if I was, I was with my CTA full-time students the other day, and we're discussing their paper. And the students were saying to me, but um, I was asking them, so what went wrong? Why, you know, can we just discuss? And some of them said to me, required such and such was so difficult that even when I got to this particular part, you know, I was still, when I got to King 4, I was still worried, I was still concerned, etc. Et and I said to them, don't cry over school, school. guys. This is expensive, confirm. <laughs> and you don't want to redo this. <laughs> if the solution cannot come up, if you cannot formulate it, leave it. And that is what it is. That is what it is. It is reality. Snap out of it. Go and answer the next requirement. Maximize on that. After all, you are working for 45 months. After all, remember that. You are not even working for 100. You are working for what? 45 so that you can get 50. Because the other five you are going to get them for presentation. If you do get them. Right. So, snap out of it. Just go and do the next thing. Also, exam technique. Finish with what? With, what? with that which is difficult. Now, I was talking to the students and I was saying to them, the problem that you guys have when you are trying to determine which required to start with. You think I know client acceptance. And so therefore you're just going to say I'm going to start with client acceptance. No, that's not all. Do you know client acceptance in the context of the scenario and the requirement? Will you be able to answer that client acceptance question? It could be even math weights evaluations, and valuations have always been easy for you. But given the information that you have, is it easy? Do not waste time. Now you might find risk assessment as the most difficult part for you in terms of the auditing syllabus. But in that particular day, or substantive procedures might be very difficult for you, but in that particular day, those substantive procedures are over something that you can actually do quite easily. So don't just say, because I know this, because I know that. And don't say, because it's 20, it's 20 marks, so I have to start with it. No. Go and start with that five marker. If you know that I'm going to get all what? Five marks. It's okay. The next thing, if the next question you know is 10 marks, go and do that what? 10 marker. Remember, you're working towards your 200 marks. So if you get 95, is that 200? You can get five out of 20. And you're thinking, let me go and rush and start with the 20 marker. You can still get five out of 20. And imagine how much time you'd have wasted. And you can get five out of five in three minutes. I asked you a question that you guys didn't um, that you guys didn't answer. What's the objective of the exam? In the exam, what are you, what is your objective? 
I said, I said that, that's missing something. So your objective, yes, ma'am? I can't fight here. Yeah? Precisely. Obtain the highest number of marks in the shortest possible time. Now, if, if that three hour exam can be given in 10 hours, we'll get 100. But they've timed it, isn't it? Because time is a what? It's an important factor. So, your objective in the exam, passing becomes a default. It becomes a coincidence. But your objective is to earn the highest number of marks in the shortest time, what? Possible. So you want to get to 50 in the shortest time possible. So start with that which you know. Get 50 and then do the rest. You know you can. You can start asking for more papers to put pressure on him. <laughs> okay. Because risk um, and the computer environment is important. We also need to know what does King 4 say about those things. What does King 4 say about risk governance? What does King 4 say about IT and all that? We need to at least have an idea of those things. What's the responsibility of the risk committee? Remember, um, I'm not saying go and learn the national code, but I'm saying just take it with you in the exam. If you've got time when you're relaxing, just flag. The key things like your your your, um, your audit committee, your risk committee, your board of directors, your CEO, your your company secretary, just flag those things in the national code so that if it's examined, at least you know where to find. You can start reading the exam, it's okay. But at least you just know where to find those things. Okay. So it's very important that you do that. Okay. Now you find that um, in South Africa. There is what is called a, a risk, uh, sorry, uh, an investment strike. South African companies are not investing in South Africa. So because of that, uh, this is why I was telling in that one year they talked about um, going diversifying into another country. That can come again. That can be examined again. Diversifying into a different country, things like country risk and all that can be examined. Diversifying into another country means already your groups are what? If they're going to purchase a subsidiary in a different country, groups are already triggered, right? So do you know your group audits? Where do your related parties come in? What about the disclosures? Do you have an idea of what should happen? Um, working with component auditors, which, which eyes are dealt with working with component auditors? That can come. That can also be your internal audit, because remember I said risk is also an, an important thing. It could also be things to do with your internal audit. Can you rely on the work of the internal audit? Can you rely on the work of the component auditor? That can be something that can be what? Examined. Um, issues to do with transfer pricing, especially in your math, goodwill. They can examine goodwill. What about goodwill? Whether to impair goodwill or whether not to impair. They can describe something to you. And then they tell you that these guys didn't impaid. And they're asking you as the auditor to say, should they have what? Impaid. What procedures should you carry out then to say, to determine whether goodwill should be impaired or not? Now, if you don't know your IFRIS, if you don't know your IFRIS, what? Three. You will not know what procedures, what's important, what you should be asking, what substantive procedures you can carry out in light of things like that. Obviously, due diligence will also become an issue. Do we know how to do a due diligence? What's important about a due diligence? What's important about a due diligence is where is the money going to be made? Why do they want to buy this organization? Are they buying it for its assets? So whether the entity is a going concern or it's not, might not be an issue. Highly unlikely. But if they're buying it for its assets, do the assets exist? Do the, do, does this company actually own them? Are they in a good condition? It is, those are the procedures that you'd carry out over your what? Your due diligence. Due diligence, guys, is just think about if you wanted to buy a car or if you wanted to buy a house, what are the things that you'd consider? This person that wants to sell the house to me, do they really own the house? Is it really theirs? Have I, have I looked at the title deeds? 
Have I looked at this? Okay, I want to buy the house. Does the house actually exist? Where? So this guy is telling me that the house is in Waterford. Is it truly Waterford? Um, I've, I've read about a lot of borrowings. You have heard about a lot of borrowings. Now there are a lot of borrowings. There's borrowings of this, borrowings of that, borrowings of that, borrowings of. Now we have our normal borrowings like the the broad the west or the rocket hill, the what, the what is it? We know some of those. But then there are new borrowings. You guys don't know that. Uh, so none of you have been trying to buy a stand <laughs> Now someone should come and tell I'm selling a stand in Borodos. Someone will come and tell you I'm stand, I'm selling a stand in what? In Borodos. Now we've got um, we've got things like Charlotte's Brook, this brook, that brook, that brook, a lot of brooks, right? That are that are eminent. And someone will tell you, I've got, I'm selling a stand at the brook. <laughs> and it's not the moment or what? And so obviously you'll say, no, my friend, before I buy this stand, I would want to wear what? Physically wear. I want to see the title deeds. But what are you inspecting for on the title deeds? Is it maybe how big is this piece of land? That's just your due diligence. Things that, you, things that you do on a day to day basis before making a decision of whether or not to buy something. So you want to go, you see, ah, you've gone past the same levels. Okay, fair and fine, we're still in Borodo. You've gone past the Ellen's. Okay, fine, still, so we're still in Borodo. You've gone past, um, what's this? You've gone past, uh, yes. 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 you've gone past the wash out. And then you take a right turn somewhere. Then you go down. <laughs> And then you go, you know, you start going up a hill and you go down a hill and you kill and you go the other way. Is it? And you're like, which group is this one? So, like, so that's why you need to what? Physical identify. So if you're going to be doing your due diligence procedures and you don't talk about some of those things, would that be a due diligence? If they're telling you it's a business who are selling ingredients, what are you going to do? You're going to inspect those ingredients for what? For the expired date. They'll sell you spices <coughs> that have expired. Now, if you're going to do a due diligence, and people will say, ah, this person can't run a business because you bought expired. No, you were just silly before you bought, right? So you need to make sure that you, you actually, where is the money? What is it that this business is interested in? Have I audited those things? Do they exist? Are they in the right condition? Am I happy with that? That's your due diligence. Business risk assessment that's going to come from what? From that diversification. You also need to know, to know that. As well as the audit risk that's going to come. So remember, it could be client continuance. But it's client continuance, but they decided to diversify. So they acquired a different, a new subsidiary. Now, for that subsidiary, and you're the one that has to audit it, it means that you need to know, you need to carry out your client acceptance for that subsidiary. You need to do all those procedures of asking for the phone number. Okay. You're thinking about asking for the phone number. <laughs> okay. All right. Any questions before I go to... The, what I asked you to do. Are you guys tired? Mm. You're tired. Yes. What about me that's standing and talking and talking? <laughs> Alright, so I, I'll give you five minutes, sir. Five minutes and then we can come and quickly look at what I asked you to do. <laughs>
Okay. So um, that guy, Agan Zitemba, is the CEO and one of the co-founders of, of the organization. Okay. Just to give you a little bit of a note. Temba is the CEO and one of the co-founders of that organization. Are we done? Are we done? Page five and six. If the marks are a lot, 
Like in that particular year, it was more than 30 marks just to review general entries. You can therefore go and put the positive things as well as the negative things. But if the mark allocation is not much, 10, 12 or something like that, let's start with the negatives because they're saying critically evaluated. And then when we're done with the negatives, if we're done at 8 and they want 12, we can give them forward positives. But the mark allocation is going to 10 if you're going to put positives and negatives. But what is the review? That is the first thing that you need to, or the second thing that you need to determine. What is the review? So if you're reviewing something, it means somebody has done work. Agreed? Somebody has done what? Work. And that work was done to meet a particular objective. Agreed? So one, you need to know what is the objective of this work that was done. If we go to this working paper, let's go to this working paper. What is the objective of this work that was done? So in this case, we are lucky because it is told to us and explicitly they state the objective. In some cases, they might not explicitly state the what? The objective. You might be asked to review a working paper on client acceptance and they don't state the objective. But the objective of the work that was done is to ultimately come, with a, come up with a decision of whether to accept or to decline a audit client. Agreed? So you need to ask yourself, what is the objective of this work that was done? So if we look at this, they say that it is to detect material misstatement, misstatements in the 2019 annual financial statements resulting from the transactions on Timber Gutters loan account and from the loan balance as at 31 August 2019. So can we see that generally this is to try and detect material misstatements? How do we detect material misstatements? By carrying out what? Substantive what? So we need to bear that in mind. And substantive procedures are formulated to do what? <coughs> to confirm assertions. Agreed? Yes. To confirm assertions. This is you having a thought process. You are not yet writing anything down. One, what is my mark allocation? Two, what is the objective of this work? That was what? That was done. Fair and fine? And then when you go into review, you are reviewing for one, completeness. Is the work that was done, is it what? Complete. Did they do everything that they were supposed to do? Whether it's client acceptance, whether it's um, trying to obtain um, audit evidence over, or, or to detect material misstatements, whether it's a report, um, whether it's whatever it is that they're doing, right? That's one. What is it? Is it complete? If they ticked everything that they were supposed to what? Do. As if they done all of it. Secondly, that which was done, or maybe you could even start with this one. That which was done, is it appropriate? So we're reviewing for appropriateness and completeness. In light of the objective. Appropriateness, completeness in light of the objective. What to put down is determined by the mark allocation. So if we go to this particular one, it's 10 marks. 10 marks, if we look at it, that's probably not very much, is it? And I'm sure if we can try and look at this, we can come up with 10 marks of negatives. We can. So one thing is, they are trying to detect misstatements. And we said misstatements um, are obtained through looking at what? Our substantive procedures, carrying out substantive procedures. So it means that, and substantive procedures are carried out to confirm what? Assertions. So we want to look at what was done. We look at those four procedures, each and every one of them. Is it appropriate to have done that procedure? Is it appropriate to have done that procedure? If it's yes, then you can take it on the, on the scenario, is it? So this is fine. What about the outcome? They gave us the findings. Given the procedure, 
the outcome? Is the outcome appropriate? In light of what they have given us, is this outcome reasonable? In light of, in this particular case, they gave us the what? The ledger, the general ledger, is it? In light of what has been given there, is this what? Appropriate. Is this finding or this conclusion appropriate? Fair fine. When we're done with that, we then say, okay, let's say everything is appropriate. What about um, all the assertions? Can we say we have obtained sufficient appropriate audit evidence? That's the objective. Agreed? That's the objective. To confirm, is it, or to obtain sufficient appropriate audit evidence over the loan account. That it is not materially what? Misstated. So can we then say that conclusion? Can we reach that conclusion? Can we meet that objective by just these four procedures? If not, what are the additional procedures that should be carried out? What are the high risk assertions here? Remember, this is why I told you, who is this guy? This guy is the CEO. And he is what? A co-owner. So what is the risk? The biggest risk is what? Override of controls or fraud, isn't it? That is the biggest risk. So the procedures that they have carried out, are they then enough for us to conclude that ah, everything is fine? <coughs> Let's go to the general ledger. So we look at the conclusion and we say, is the conclusion actually appropriate? That's a review. Somebody has come up with a conclusion. Is the conclusion appropriate? Okay. So we look at the first transaction, sell, sell, uh, salaries and wages, reference payroll, description, Mrs. Gatti's salary. That's his wife, is it? How much? $4,000 uh, in the negative. And documents um, inspected monthly payroll report. Is that enough to actually for you to say this 4,000 is okay? There's no misstatement over this 4,000. That's not enough, is it? What should be backing this? What other things should they have looked at? What documents should they have inspected? Other than just the payroll reports. The contracts or the agreements is she even employed by this organization? Maybe she's not. What else would you have wanted to look at? Is she authorized to actually be getting this money? Where would you get that? Maybe management meetings, is it minutes, right? Or a contract or something. But what does this trigger? All your four courses. If somebody is going to be receiving something, you know, or certain things in their salary, what does it trigger? Tax. Would you have thought about that? To say, well, what other documents should I have inspected to say there are no material statements coming out of this? It's supposed to increase their pay as well. So can we see the returns or can we see the calculations to confirm that? So can you see the, the things that you're supposed to think about, the things that you're supposed to look at? That's a review. Okay. Don't restrict yourself to just, especially at ITC, don't restrict yourself to just one course to say, ah, this is auditing, so I think, you know. If something triggers, like in this particular case, that triggers PSUN, and it's something, confirm if you're going to audit, that's something that you'd want to see, right? It's something that you definitely would want to see. Are they paying PSUN? Is it paying PSUN? Are these payments actually authorized? We are seeing the, the second payment, it's a motor vehicle. Again, we might want to see um, the agreements need to see that it's supposed to get a motor vehicle of that amount, is it? We, we need to see, is the 30,000 the amount that was authorized? We need to see that. But why is that 30,000 positive? Can we see something where this clerk uh, actually did that as a procedure to say, but why is this positive? Where they questioned that. Shouldn't it be negative? Is it? So you're reviewing. So pay attention to detail when you're reviewing. And all they looked at is the supplier invoice. 
An important thing is what information have I been given? In review, what information have I been given? Your information that you've been given will assist you in determining appropriateness and completeness. All right? Um, these questions are bound to come as well. They are quite highly examinable review questions. That's why I actually wanted us to look at that question before, um, before we end the session. Okay. Um, I'll send you the, the solution maybe on Monday. I'll send the solution uh, to this required uh, to, to the whole scenario. It's, it's, it's an ITC question. So don't necessarily say, ah, so the solutions are like this, they're like that. No. It's an ITC question. But what I want you to mainly focus on is maybe I can just send you the, the solution for this bit for the review only. Okay. And then you can look at what should have happened, how it should have been done, how the solution can actually come out.